Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. As always, if you enjoy these videos, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And our first story of the day is by Uda Jessahajar Bedid. Ignoring the developer? It's your money. I was at the beginning of my career as a developer intern at a local IT company. I was still attending university classes. The agreement was that I would be working 6 hours a week. We were creating a web application with a central user management system. Important later. You could use the same credentials for the different modules. This meant a metric ton of users were created for testing and it was the same data set as the client's demo accounts with live email addresses. The company hired four other interns like me, one senior developer, and one part-time developer. No architect, nobody to design the architecture. The project was not on a tight budget, yet they wanted to save money on everything. They wanted to use the internal framework that was supposed to make things easier. Spoilers, it made our lives a nightmare. But the order was to use that, we had no say in it. We tried to warn the boss that this whole project's going to be a nightmare, but he simply ignored us at those rare times when he was at the office. We've been missing deadlines every time, nothing was working properly, the system was slow. A logical response from the company was to make us do overtime. We were working 10 hours a day while studying for classes, preparing for end of term exams, the remaining time we were trying to socialize, family, girlfriend, etc. It soon turned out that we would need to put much more effort into the project than the company intended to. The framework had tons of bugs. Every release was a nightmare. 12 hour workdays became regular. One of the interns reached 270 hours of work in a month. We were paid by the hour at least, so we were compensated in a way. The test user database has been used by the client for demo purposes. It had their live email address with proper group memberships. Every action made in the app sent an email to a group that was eventually sent out to the client as well. They could just simply ignore that. That was around 10 emails a day. After a year, I was at the end of my university years and it slipped out of my mouth that I don't feel inclined to support this big pile of bugs. The boss asked me to come into his office. He told me that they weren't satisfied with my performance and they won't offer me a full-time position after I would graduate. This was the point where I snapped. They gave me an option to either get my crap together or leave. I've noticed that the email service wasn't working on the test environment, yet it was scheduled. This means that the email's been put in the queue but not delivered. I've mentioned this to the senior developer. He ignored me like I was the idiot who wasn't going to be there anyway. I was sitting there like, should I care? I admit, I even got upset about this. Then it hit me. I'll just let them do what they want. Once the service is fixed, it will explode eventually. Once I had my degree in my hand, I left the company. The other interns also got their degree, but they were offered a full-time position. One of them left three weeks after me leaving. They insisted to a probation period for him, but didn't expect him to actually leave. He did. Another guy left around two months after that. Here comes the best part. They fixed the email service after a month. In one hour, around 400,000 emails were sent to every user in the system. The mail server could handle the load, but the client had to assort these one by one. They threatened the team with contacting the CEO. The team already had a reputation because of the missed deadline. Somehow, they managed to push the app live. The requirement said that 500 concurrent users should be properly handled by the server the client had already paid for, but it couldn't keep up with the load. The company had to buy around 200 gigabytes of RAM. They have run out of budget way before the initial live release. The company had to pay more in terms of hardware and penalty than the original budget was. After leaving the company, I got a full-time job with fractions of stress and a more employee-friendly environment. Let me ask you guys something. If you had the option to either work a job that was relatively stressful but paid enough money to keep your life comfortable, or a job that was much less stressful, or a job that was much less stressful but a little bit more tight on the money you're making, which option would you choose and why? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Temerita. You need me to explain how I did not make a mistake a third time? You got it. I worked at the post office for just under two years. In fact, I just gave notice and this is my last week. My admin job is union, albeit a smaller, weaker one, 
and the postal workers have this massive, stronger union where everything that could possibly be considered a mistake turns into a grievance. My job involved bidding on assignments. These are temporary assignments to backfill people on extended sick leave, which with COVID got way busier. When bidding for other things, vacation, different shifts or schedules, and transfers, it's all about seniority. Whoever has been with the postal service the longest wins. There's a few positions where you have to prove you can do the specialized work, but most of it's just plain seniority. Getting seniority, dates accurate and updated is crucial. We rely on them being accurate, but guess what? My team can't change them. It's the union and HR, and boy, they sure do like to take their sweet time. Anywho, recently we had a bidding for a whack of different positions, but it's not about plain seniority wins. The rules discussed and agreed upon with the union was people within the same section, regardless of shift, get first dibs at the positions, in seniority order of course. Then when all the section people's bids are considered, then postal workers outside the section get consideration, in seniority order of course. Because of this extra caveat, I have to do things differently than others on my team and pay extra attention to where these people are by section based on what's in the system and not whatever they feel like riding on the bid. They even take liberties with their seniority date and heaven forbid they know their rank. Number used when two workers have the same seniority date. I only do this bid every other month because it's time consuming to get it right. Give everyone available a viable chance, get the paperwork to HR for payroll and schedule changes, give the workers and their supervisors notice, etc. Plus, people are constantly coming and going, affecting these assignments. COVID has made my job a lot harder and with working remotely after being shoved into the 21st century, being afraid of catching COVID at the plant when I do go in because it's had two outbreaks and mask wearing is a joke there, helping the kids with virtual school and general pandemic fatigue. I managed to avoid any bypasses this round by sheer perseverance and exhaustion, yet this one employee felt like I bypassed them and told their supervisor. Supervisor did the right thing by emailing me the concern and asking for a consideration. I looked into the matter and saw that while they had higher seniority than two workers who were awarded assignments, this worker was out of the section, so seniority was not priority for winning over the two who won. I laid out the scenario, attached the rules, and let the supervisor know to tell the worker no bypass occurred. The very next day, I get a local union rep catch me while at the office asking about the same worker, same concern. I tell them I had the supervisor ask me already and explain the above, rep leave satisfied. Then two days after that and my second to last day on the job, my supervisor forwards me an email from the union local president for this same darn worker. Cue malicious compliance. I used to just email the answer to my boss to reply, but decided to save us all time. I email the local union's president that my boss forwarded me their inquiry and that the worker asked their supervisor already to and they got an answer. Copied the supervisor, I reattached the rules for them, remind them that the rules are posted in a glass case next to the bid posters and results, that the rules were agreed upon by the union's local reps, and I personally had a follow up with a rep regarding questions. Clerks like me never talk to the union without my boss, but I earned the right to because I know how to keep my mouth shut. I attach a copy of the worker's bid since I scan all the bids that get considered and overlooked. I lay out what assignments the worker bid for. I stated the seniority date of all the people who won bids the worker tried for that have higher seniority and the one that had lower was in the same section as the position being bid for, but the complaining worker was outside the section, so seniority didn't help. Lastly, I confirmed the worker's seniority date as it's listed in the system because we can only use what's in the computer. Like I said, if there's a problem with the date, take it up with the union and HR. I end with this. Fortunately, there's no bypass as more junior in-section workers are entitled to the assignment before more senior out-of-section, in this case, workers' section. Please let the member know this and we encourage them to continue to bid for future assignments.
For those interested, my new job pays 25% more, plus better benefits, better industry, uh, letter mail is not really in demand. And while it's not as close to home, non-union, and probably more work than the job I'm leaving, I was experiencing workplace harassment, bullying, and my boss was being ineffective at his job in supporting me. Although the new job might be a little bit more hands-on, might need to roll up your sleeves a little bit more and get your hands dirty frequently, just the fact that OP was able to get out of a toxic environment, remove themselves from the stress of that place, seems like an easy bonus to me. This next story is by Drama Guy 23 and another thing, Dan. This is a famous family story from my dad, growing up as the oldest of five boys. As you might imagine in a family with just two parents and five rambunctious boys, my grandparents were fairly strict, but as often happens, the older boys wore them down, so the younger boys got away with a lot. But finally, with the youngest, Dan, the parents decided to make a stand on the topic of the clothing worn at the dinner table. Dan liked to lounge around the house in grey gym shorts, no shirt, but my grandparents felt this was inappropriate attire for the dinner table and would nightly hassle him to go change before sitting down to dinner. The other boys felt this was silly. If Dan was wearing that all the time around the house, why should the dinner table be any different? And would often take his side, which only caused my grandparents to ratchet things up. Finally, they pronounced that anyone at the dinner table taking Dan's side about the attire question would be grounded. Cue malicious compliance. The next night, when Dan came down to dinner, predictably wearing what he always wore, the parents told him to go change, and the other boys emphatically piled on. Yeah, Dan, don't you have any respect for your family? Yeah, Dan, this isn't your school locker room. Yeah, Dan, I've never been so appalled. Yeah, Dan, I can't even stand to look at you right now. And on and on it went, around and around the table, objection after objection for several well-planned minutes. My grandparents watched the proceedings, first with unexpected pleasure, then with increasing bewilderment, and finally with dismay, as they realized the boys were going to simply go on like this indefinitely, and all the while, my grandmother's nicely planned meal sitting untouched, and getting cold. Finally, the parents exchanged a look, recognized defeat, and my grandmother muttered, Fine, Dan, wear whatever you want at dinner. And they all sat down and tucked in. To this day, and our entire extended family, we retain the tradition of denouncing any seemingly arbitrary or frivolous rules by simply calling out, Yeah, Dan. If you say, Yeah, Dan, at any of the frivolous rules, I sure wonder what they say when there actually is a very blatant rule being broken. You know, like smacking your mouth when you're eating. I feel like that would call for a lot more than just a, yeah, Dan. And our final story of the day is by Gree, only doing what was asked. Outside my main job, I work casually at a leisure center, pools, gym, sauna, steam and spa. And due to COVID, we have restrictions on how many people can be in an area. Last time we had restrictions, there was a booking system in place for the small areas, such as the sauna, steam and spa, to ensure not too many people were in that area and to maximize their use. This also meant that as staff, we could easily track how long people had been in certain areas and ask them to please move on. People complained that they were restricted to only one hour per booking, so when feedback came in, the general response was to do away with the booking system. In regards to the ensuring access to the facilities, the response was that they're all adults and can regulate the usage fairly themselves. So we did. No bookings needed, only the allowance of people per space remains as dictated by the government. Yesterday was our first day open with unlimited time in the center. We regularly had to go to the sauna and steam room to remove extra people, signs on the door of only four as their small rooms. The complaints started. The ones complaining were the same ones that complained about the booking system. And by complain, these are the type of people who don't talk to you. They yell at you. I don't think my mask could hide my poop-eating grin as I explained to them, but we did what you asked and got rid of the booking system, and... But you guys said you could regulate it yourself. Let's be real, they were never truly asking for the ability to regulate it themselves. They were asking for the ability to have the rules that they could abuse. They were saying, I don't like being limited, 
So mess those rules up so they're kind of vague and I can abuse them. I think that's really all that it was. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. So of all these stories I've read today, which is your favorite and why? Let me know in the comments down below. And if you haven't yet, if you could like and subscribe, that would mean a lot to me. Whatever you do, whether it's liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, all of it helps grow this channel and I appreciate the heck out of it. So until next time, I'll see you all tomorrow with some more stories.